very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of, our, all of you joining us online today to this online public uh, talk on men's health organized by the Society, Singapore Society of Oncology and supported by uh, Men's Health Singapore as well as Onco Care Cancer Center. Uh, hi, my name is Dr. Lee Fang Jan. I'm a urologist and the vice president of the Society of Men's Health Singapore. Okay, um, it's a great privilege to be here, to be your chairperson for the session today. I'm a strong advocate for men's health, both professionally through my work as a urologist treating men's health condition, as well as through my society, the Society of Men's Health Singapore. Okay, I'm very excited to be here to, to, to share with you, okay, uh, uh, on this talk on men's health. And today for this talk, we have three very distinguished cancer specialists from Onco Care Cancer Center who will be sharing with us topics related to the top three cancer conditions afflict afflicting men, in, namely lung cancer, prostate cancer, as well as colorectal cancer. The talks will take place through three sessions, um, followed by a Q&A session. Okay, feel free to text in your question through the talk. I'll be there to pose them to our distinguished speakers at the end for them to be answered okay so without further ado we'll be starting off with the lung cancer talk session okay um the speaker will be dr tan chi singh okay dr tan chi singh is a senior medical oncologist from onco care cancer center prior to joining onco care cancer center He's a senior consultant in the hematology and oncology department in National University Cancer Institute of Singapore, uh, NUS, NUH, and a visiting consultant in Ting Fong General Hospital. He completed his medical studies in Singapore, NUS, and completed a further fellowship training in the prestigious academy, academic medical, uh, through the Academic Medical Development Award Fellowship to subspecialize in specialization a uh, personalization of lung cancer therapy at Edinburgh's hospital cambridge and uk his main clinical interest is in lung and thoracic cancer as well as head and neck cancer without further ado uh, let's invite dr tan to share with us the new exciting treatment options for lung cancer in 2022 hi good afternoon everyone thank you for joining us today uh, my name is Dr. Tan Chi Singh. I'm a medical oncologist in Onco Care Singapore. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for the kind introduction earlier. And uh, today, I'll start off the, of the three talks focusing on the lung cancer and what are the things that we can expect for patients who are uh, down with lung cancer in 2022. So this is my topic outline today. Sounds a little bit intimidating, but don't worry. The slides are very easy to understand and I'll guide you through along the way. So we start off with how bad is the cancer situation, lung cancer in Singapore. So unfortunately, cancer remains one of the top uh, death of uh, all death in Singapore and accounting for about one third of all death in Singapore, uh, followed by pneumonia and ischemic heart disease. These are the chart uh, looking at the top 10 cancers in Singapore for both male and female. And uh, lung cancer is the second commonest male cancer constituting about 15 percent and the third commonest cancer in female at about seven percent only despite that lung cancer remains quite deadly uh, it registered about 27 of all male cancer related death so it's a number one male killer and female is a number two killer by ethnicity, generally, it follows our population's uh, uh, ethnicity proportion, where about more than 80% are Chinese patients, followed by Malay and Indian. There is no one particular ethnicity that is more predominant compared to the rest. This is a very sad reality on the ground. Unfortunately, a majority, about 80 to 85% of patients, are diagnosed either in the locally advanced in stage 3 or even stage 4 cancers. So this is something that we need to address. 
So what are some risk factors that we do encounter uh, for can lung cancer patients? And I'll get a lot of questions on this during my regular consultations. Tobacco. So it's one of the most preventable cause of cancer, not only lung cancer. And each adult smoker lose an average of about 13 years of their life due to this addiction. So on the left, you can see that the cancer related from smoking and on the right is a chronic diseases that is associated with a chronic smoking. So lung cancer is one of the commonest problems associated with chronic smoker, hair neck cancer, bladder cancer, stomach cancer and so on and so forth. Not only cancer, patients who are chronic smoker are also affiliated with problems of stroke, heart diseases, and of course, chronic lung diseases and asthma. In a typical uh, filtered cigarette that we uh, smoker inhale on a daily basis, they are made out of a lot of chemicals. For example, nicotine, actually is an insecticide, ammonia, which is a toilet cleaner. So now obviously none of these are naturally occurring and these are obviously bad for your health. For those who choose not to smoke, but unfortunately because of the environment, the home, neighbors and the workplace, it has been strongly linked that second hand smoking can expose a patient to lung cancer. It is likely related to the duration from since young, for example, from a family history or intensity of exposure. For example, some patients do have to entertain clients, for example, so that may be a problem. Even if you're married to a smoker, the lifetime risk has increased to 27% uh, of getting a lung cancer. And if you do have a parent who are smoker, your lifetime risk increases by about 10 to 15%. Apart from exposure to smoking, any other risk factor? This is one of the commonest uh, questions that I do get. Genetic, is it runs in the family? So fortunately, lung cancer are generally not inherited. However, there are specific tumor mutation that has been identified and on a yearly basis, we can identify more and more. The commonest mutations are EGFR, a mouthful. Basically, it accounts for about 50% of uh, lung cancers in Asian females. Male patients also can be affiliated by this particular mutation. Other rare, rare less common mutations include ALK, ROS1 and the newly found MET exon 14 skipping mutation. They are much rarer in the range of about 1 to 5%. Another question that I get do get a lot will be that of a screening. Is there a role for screening for lung cancer? So unlike breast cancer, colon cancer and cervical cancer where they are effective and routinely employed uh, cancer screening tool, Lung cancer screening are not suitable for general population, mainly because they are quite rare and it's only suitable for patients who are considered high risk. What is high risk? I'll define it a little bit later in the next few slides. The only tool that has been validated to improve uh, cancer screening will be that of a CT scan or we call it low dose tomography, computed tomography scan. This is validated by uh, both American and European clinical trial where they employed about tens and twenties and thirties thousands of patients where if you were to do this lung cancer screening trial in high risk patient, you can reduce the mortality by about 20 to 25 percent respectively. So who should be screened? How do I define high risk? Generally, the US guideline recommends that a yearly low dose CT scan of the lung for patients who are considered heavy smoker and what is defined by heavy smoker we call it a 30 pack year a very simple calculation if you were to smoke one pack every day for one year that's considered one pack year so 30 pack year could means that you smoke one pack for the past 30 years or you could smoke two packs for the past 15 years. So that's considered high heavy smoking. Or patients who have uh, quit smoking for the past 15 years, the effect of that still lingers on. So that still makes you in a higher risk population. And of course, patients who are considered uh, slightly elderly population between 55 to 80 years old. 
if you fall into these three criteria, do speak to your uh, doctors, oncologists, or even lung doctors mm -hmm. to consider whether or not yearly low dose CT scan will be suitable for you. The last MOH um, guidelines cancer screening are 2010, 2010 did not address this because the study happened after that. What are the risks of screening? Generally, as with most cancer screening, there are risks of false positive, meaning that what they thought is cancer may not be actually cancer. That may lead to further testing, unnecessary biopsy, and obviously increases the risk. So this has to be done in a very systematic manner and the doctor and the uh, physician who recommended must explain this to you. Of course, CT scan is also expose you to uh, radiation. That is why the keyword here, a low dose CT scan is required. Um, just to give you an example, a CT scan of the lung versus a low dose CT scan of the lung, the radiation dose is only seven times less than the conventional CT scan. Do discuss with your uh, doctor or lung doctors for the individual risk profile before considering lung cancer screening. What are the typical signs and symptoms of lung cancer? Unfortunately, they can be very non-specific. I think the key here would be the word progressive, getting worse, or that is doesn't heal on its own. For example, prolonged cough with or without blood in the phlegm, prolonged pro breathlessness, or unexplained back aches and pain that progressively get worse over time. As you can see, generally they are not that specific. If your doctor suspects that you may have a lung cancer, perhaps they have done an x-ray or even a low dose CT scan, one of the things important uh, step forward would be to do a biopsy. A biopsy would mean that taking a little bit of sample from the abnormal area. Uh, for lung cancer patients, I would just label it as an internal scope internal biopsy or external biopsy. Internal biopsy mean that you put in a camera scope all the way to the throat into the airway and there will be at the end of it there will be a small needle or if your the suspicious lesions are just next to the chest wall they can uh, inject directly through the chest wall and get a sample from the suspicious tumor and send the sample for further analysis. Depending what we see generally we can talk a little bit more about the lung cancer uh, treatment based on the subtype. So lung cancer conventionally are made up of two types, small cell lung cancer, 99% are associated with chronic smoking, or non-small cell cancer, which is much more common in Singapore, constitute about 85% or more. And out of this non-small cell, the majority are that of an adenocarcinoma, which constitute about half of the cases. This is a very busy guideline, but I just want to emphasize what it's trying to tell is that in the advanced lung cancer, the treatment is highly personalized. What I, do I mean by that? So a lung cancer is no longer a lung cancer per se. Generally, we want to drill down to the individual genetic mutations that we can find. These are the very basic things that we routinely check for, and sometimes I do check more beyond this. Depending what we see, for example, in the first five here, if you do have a genetic positivity, perhaps instead of going for chemotherapy, you could go for the oral targeted therapy. And for patients with a high PDL1, which is a marker for effectiveness for immunotherapy, that can be an option for another, another subgroup of patients as well. So why is targeted therapy? A medical term would be that of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor or TKI for short. Basically, it's a tablet medication. Some patients only take one tablet a day up to two to three per day. It is only suitable for patients with a specific mutation. This is a normal check x-ray for a patient where you can see that this is a right lung and this is a left lung. Our heart is right, a little bit off center to the left and the normal lung should be black color. You can see that this is a case uh, study one, Mr. Y is a 64-year-old gentleman, non-smoker his entire life, presented to 
uh, a lung specialist for breathlessness that occurred for about three to four months. His chest history was done and a PET scan was done. PET is a very highly specialized scan for cancer. Anything that's colored, for example, like this, a uh, very active tumor. If you were to compare a chest X-ray that was normal versus this particular gentleman, you can see that there are a lot of uh, white specks, a little bit cloud-like, fluffy-like. These are the tumor. They are basically invading into the normal lung for this patient. Fortunately for him, he we found that he have an EGFR, one of the more common mutation uh, in this particular non-smoker male patient. So before we start the medication, the chest ratio is this on the left, and this is 10 days after starting the tablet medication. Prior to that, when I first saw him, he requires an oxygen tube to help him breathe, but within a week or two, the patient is managed to wean off the oxygen and patient able to uh, do, her, do his usual activities at home. We can see that this is a very good response with oral targeted therapy. And fortunately for this particular gentleman, uh, we started him in the latest third generation, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we are getting more and more specific. So for example, this particular mutation, Mr. Zach, who was an ex-smoker that quit eight years ago, first presented with back pain that he ignored for a while, but it was progressive until the point that patient requires a wheelchair. An investigation revealed that patient have a lung cancer and a very rare mutation. Uh, we call it MAC exon 14 skipping mutation. This is a PET scan for the patient. All the hot spots here are the tumor, and this is the main tumor on the left side. These are the bone area and the, on the shoulder. So about two months post treatment, you can see that there is a decrease in the hot spots. And this particular patient was also very fortunate because when we found the mutation, there was a new targeted therapy specific for this, the portinate that was approved in Singapore, and he was uh, started on this medication and he's doing very well now. So what is immunotherapy? So in a normal immune system, our immune will check all types of cancer cells and if they do find it, they will kill it off immediately. So what happens is that Acute, the immune cells produces this rare pdl one a protein on the surface that masks the cancer cell. Uh, sorry for those uh, Harry Potter fans here. Imagine Harry Potter as a tumor. When he put on an invisibility cloak, he's trying to hide itself from the immune system. So the immune system cannot attack it. So cancer immunotherapy has been a breakthrough since 2013. And in fact, in 2018, it won the Nobel Peace Prize in medicine uh, was awarded to these uh, two particular scientists for discovery using immunotherapy to treat cancer. This is uh, one of the more dramatic cases that I've seen uh, in recent years where we checked for all the known mutations. It was all negative, but patients have a moderate amount of PDL1, which is an immune uh, spike that was on the tumor. So what I did was to start a patient on chemotherapy and immunotherapy and within about two and a half weeks, you can see that this large tumor on the neck that is basically a limb node from a lung has shrunk dramatically. And this is a scan that shows that internally is also shrunken as well. But can we do better? All the, all the examples we've seen earlier, uh, all the approvals are in the advanced stage, stage four, but can we move upstream to improve the cure rate? Yes, of course, and we must try to do that. Increasingly, for the past a year or so, a lot of the targeted therapy and immunotherapy not only has been approved for stage 4 cancers, it has moved on to stage 3 approval, and more recently, for the past year or so, there are approval for patients in stage 1 to stage 3. So just to give example, um, there is an immunotherapy has been approved for patients who are unresectable stage 3. And for the past uh, year or so, both targeted therapy and immunotherapy has been shown to be effective for early lung, early stage lung cancer in stage 1 to stage 3. And uh, individually, for example, patients who have a genetic mutation may be suitable for targeted therapy. And patients who have PDL1 positive may be suitable for immunotherapy, as explained earlier. So in conclusion, lung cancer remains one of the deadliest cancer in Singapore, especially for male. Tobacco remains the main risk factor. 
Treatment of advanced lung cancer in 2022 is highly personalized and is depending on the individual tumor profile and no longer chemotherapy for everyone. Both oral targeted therapy and immunotherapy has revolutionized the lung cancer treatment, both in stage 4, stage 3, and even early lung cancer in stage 1b to stage 3. So I think with that, uh, I thank everyone's attention. Thank you, Dr. Tan, for the kind. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tan, for the kind sharing. Uh, so exciting to see so many new treatments coming on stream for patients with uh, um, an advanced uh, lung cancer. I'm seeing some questions on stream now. Um, keep the question coming in. We'll try to take them uh, at the end of the session. Okay, uh, Dr. Tan will be fielding all these questions for you. All right. Um, I think we move on to the next uh, topic for now. All right. Okay. So the next speaker, if my, I may introduce him, is uh, he is Akil Chopra, a dear friend of mine. Okay. We've known each other for quite some time. He's a senior consultant, medical oncologist with uh, Onco Care Center at Mount Elizabeth Hospital. Prior to joining Onco Care Cancer Center, Dr. Chopra is a senior consultant. Uh, in medical oncology at John Hopkins Singapore Tantok Singh Hospital and a Jiang Associate Professor at the Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine. Okay, you uh, are known to many and uh, you know something special about Dr. Chopra that is American board certified in three specialty, internal medicine, hematology, as well as medical oncology. Okay. According to him, he has a vast experience in treating multiple cancer types, okay, uh, and one of which will include will be, you know, what he's talking about, okay, prostate cancer, okay. His topic for us today is something sinister could be hiding in your prostate. Okay, let's welcome Dr. Chopra. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for spending your valuable Sunday afternoon time with us to learn a bit about three important cancers that can affect men. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for the kind introduction. Actually, I'm very lucky that uh, Dr. Lee is hosting this uh, symposium today since he's a urologist. And part of which, uh, part of what I'm gonna talk about um, is, uh, is his speciality as well. So hopefully you can ask some questions to him as well towards the end. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tan, for a great presentation on lung cancer. So the title of my talk is something sinister could be hiding in your prostate. And as Dr. Lee already mentioned, I'm alluding to prostate cancer. So hopefully I can take the next 20 minutes or so to discuss a bit about prostate cancer and maybe answer a few questions. So let's start by uh, asking the question, what is the prostate? The prostate is a gland, which is an accessory gland of the human male reproductive system. It's actually found in a few mammals only. Uh, we believe its purpose is to produce a fluid called the uh, prostatic fluid that nourishes the sperm and becomes a part of or is a part of the semen. Uh, as you can see in this cartoon, it's located below the bladder, below the base of the urinary bladder and behind the penis. And in this uh, zoomed up uh, cartoon, you can see in the prostate, it has different lobes and towards the outside in one lobe of this particular cartoon, there is evidence of a cancerous tumor. Now, when we biopsy this part or when we biopsy the prostate, when you look under the microscope, a normal prostate looks something like this with many glands and connective tissue. And there are other non-cancerous conditions like benign prostatic hypertrophy where the prostate gland enlarges, becomes bigger than normal, and can cause difficulty in urination for men. This particularly happens with age. But in contrast, prostate cancer, as you can see in this picture, the cells have become more ugly and more aggressive and have a tendency to divide, grow, and spread. And the last picture is of prostate inflammation which is highlighted by multiple immune cells inside the prostate gland, which can happen during an infection. So I thought I'll spend the next few minutes to cover some common questions that, that may come up in your mind. So how common is prostate cancer? 
what could be some of the symptoms of prostate cancer am i at risk of getting prostate cancer how do we diagnose prostate cancer what is psa what is a prostate biopsy well i really cannot what happens next so this slide has been shown before by dr tan uh, and as he mentioned cancer continues to be one of the principal causes of death in singapore unfortunately even today and when you break uh, all the cancers down in men we see prostate is a third on the list uh, at least based on the last update by the singapore cancer registry so what could be the symptoms of prostate cancer how would one even know that they may have prostate cancer the problem is that most times as i have highlighted below there may be no symptoms at all but sometimes a man may see blood in the urine he may have painful urination hesitancy or difficulty passing urine intermittent urination incomplete emptying or sensation of incomplete emptying of the bladder prolonged emptying of the bladder and bone pain i'll explain where the bone pain comes from blood in the urine the biological or the technical term is hematuria this can be microscopic meaning you actually don't see it um, the urine looks normal to you but uh, using special techniques such as a strip as highlighted here we can detect the blood small amounts of blood or it can be gross hematuria which is uh, the urine takes a reddish tinge uh, which is due to bleeding in the urine but we must remember that blood in the urine may not, is not only a cause of uh, uh, or is not only as a result of prostate cancer it can be due to uh, many different conditions that uh, could affect the genito urinary system in a man so that includes the kidneys on uh, two kidneys on each, each side which are connected to the bladder by these pipes called the ureters the urinary bladder and the prostate and here as you can see although it's not very clear even a cancer in the kidney kidney stones cancer in the ureter cancer in the bladder or even a severe infection in this system can lead to blood in the urine so it's important to do a proper workup which your doctor or your urologist will pursue to try and find out what is the exact cause of blood in the urine and this sometimes may require imaging such as x-rays as shown on the left which can pick up kidney stones most of the time ct scans which can pick up both kidney stones as well as tumors or cancers in the genital urinary system sometimes men may need cystoscopy in which you are directly visualizing the bladder by putting a camera through the urethra into the bladder and there is an example of the the cystoscope the next question that you may ask me is well am i at a risk of getting prostate cancer and this is a very common question unfortunately there is not one reason to get prostate cancer there are multiple reasons the most important one probably is your age the older a man is the higher likelihood of getting prostate cancer in fact there were studies done in the west now uh, decades ago where autopsies have been done on old men who have died from other causes natural causes such as heart attacks or stroke and men above the age of 80 or 85 Uh, who had prostate biopsies or autopsies done and more than half of the time there was evidence of prostate cancer in their prostate so they died of something else even though they had prostate cancer and this is an important fact to remember what about family history like most cancers if you have a strong family history of prostate or similar cancers um, you can be at high risk and the risk increases depending on how many family members have the prostate cancer how close this relationship is and what was the age of diagnosis of the family member so if the family member is younger when they are diagnosed uh, it's possible that there may be a genetic reason for the prostate cancer thereby increasing your risk chronic infection of the prostate which is also sometimes termed as chronic prostatitis seems to have a positive association with developing prostate cancer a western diet which we all are guilty of at least at some point 
con- containing high levels of meat, and saturated fats, and dairy has been linked to increased risk of prostate cancer. More recently, uh, multiple studies have shown uh, you know, the possibility of developing prostate cancer due to the inheritance of a defective or a mutated gene, especially in the genes that are called DNA repair genes, one example of which is BRCA2. You may have heard of BRCA as a gene that is mutated in women with breast cancer as well. So these mutations uh, don't just increase the risk of one type of cancer, it can increase the risk of multiple types of cancers. So BRCA2 mutation can increase the risk of prostate cancer in a man, but also uterine cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. But I think it's important to understand that the multifocal and heterogeneous nature of prostate cancer makes uh, genetic studies difficult and associations difficult to make. But I think this is the future of uh, oncology uh, since we do understand now very clearly that cancer is a genetic disease. And this has also been highlighted by Dr. Tan uh, in lung cancer. So how do we diagnose prostate cancer? We consider this a triad um, requiring the diagnosis. The first is a, a digital rectal exam that is done either by a GP or urologist or even an oncologist where a finger is inserted through the rectum to feel the prostate. Now, usually a prostate cancer feels harder than a normal prostate and larger, but it doesn't always have to be this way. PSA is a simple blood test that I will discuss a little more in the subsequent slides, which when elevated can suggest the presence of prostate cancer in the prostate. But the gold standard of the diagnosis of prostate cancer, like any other cancer, is a biopsy of the prostate, which is done by the special uh, ultrasound probe, uh, which I shall discuss a little more later. And the biopsy is looking at the prostatic tissue under the microscope. And as I had alluded to in my previous slides, you see these angry looking cells, which look very different than the normal prostate glandular cells, thereby diagnosing cancer. So what is PSA to a Singaporean? Well, it's definitely not the Port Authority of Singapore. PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. And this is a glycoprotein that is produced by the cells of the prostate as well as prostate cancer. So all men have a certain amount of PSA in their blood. But if you have prostate cancer, the level goes up uh, significantly. And this can sometimes use to uh, uh, decide whether uh, uh, male needs a prostatic biopsy to rule out cancer or not. But I want to caution you that the association is not absolute. Uh, Elevated level of PSA may be seen in other conditions such as infection of the prostate, uh, enlarged prostate only, uh, or just old age. So um, this decision whether a biopsy is needed uh, depends on multiple factors, which your urologist will discuss with you and decide before proceeding with the biopsy. Well, what is a prostate biopsy again? As I had uh, shown in my previous slide, it's a relatively simple procedure done by a urologist like Dr. Lee, who is with us today. It's performed in the clinic. It uh, doesn't take too long, a few minutes, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Ultrasound probe is placed in the rectum and the prostate gland is visualized. Local anesthesia is given, of course, so that there is least amount of pain or discomfort and then multiple cores of biopsies are taken from the prostate gland as shown in this cartoon. And uh, subsequent to that, the urologist ensures there is no active bleeding and the procedure is done. There are some risks of doing a prostate biopsy like there are with any other uh, biopsy procedure. They can be bleeding for the, from the rectum for a day or two. Um, of course, uh, the urologist will ensure that you're not on any path in for the biopsy is taken. Pain, again, which is minimized by the use of anesthesia, local anesthesia. And some men may experience post biopsy fever and chills, and this can be managed uh, quite easily. Now, 
it can be sometimes confusing to understand what the biopsy report actually says because a lot of the terms that are used are technical. But suffice to say, this cartoon basically describes a normal gland of the prostate, which is lined by a single layer of cells uh, as compared to a current, uh, prostate cancer where there are multiple cells which are invading the lumen or the central part of this tube and also breaking and going into the outside of the, of the gland. And this is essentially what the pathologist is trying to see. And the pathologist will come out and uh, describe the prostate cancer in the term of a Gleason score, uh, or a Gleason scale. And this is uh, important for us, a physician involved in the treatment of prostate cancer, because it uh, gives us a understanding on how aggressive the cancer looks under the microscope. A grade three prostate cancer uh, is the least aggressive. In fact, some have argued it may not even meet the definition of prostate cancer. But as you go up, the score five, and the score is given from one to five, and the highest score um, is shown by very aggressive looking cells under the microscope. So the highest score you can get is a Gleason five plus five, because the pathologist will look at two different areas in the biopsy to come up with a more accurate scoring system. So here again, as I mentioned, the, as the score increases, the cancer aggressiveness increases, at least um, this has been shown in multiple correlative studies. So the maximum score you can get is 10. So Gleason 8 to 10 score is considered high risk prostate cancer in contrast to a Gleason 2 to 6, which is considered low risk. And this scoring system becomes quite relevant when the urologist or your oncologist deciding on the best way to manage prostate cancer. I really can what happens next. So if you're unlucky enough to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, the next step is to see if the prostate cancer is still located inside the prostate gland or it has spread outside. Again, this is important so that you can decide the best treatment for the cancer. The staging uh, or the process of determining if the prostate cancer has spread outside the prostate is done through a variety of ways, mostly by imaging or scans. Um, they can be a combination of an MRI, which gives a very accurate picture of the prostate cancer as it relates to the prostate gland and the area around the prostate gland. As I had shown you in the picture before, the prostate is located in front of the rectum, below the bladder and behind the penis. So it can invade into the rectum or go up into the bladder. This can be seen very well with the help of MRI as well as, well as cystoscopy done by the urologist. A bone scan, CT scan, or now a PSMA PET CT scan are scans used to determine if the prostate cancer has spread to other parts of the body, such as the bones. Prostate cancer is unique that it has a high propensity uh, to spread to the bones. That's why bone scan is a very integral part of imaging or staging of a prostate cancer. If the cancer after all the scans are done is confined just to the prostate gland, it is a potentially curable cancer and we will discuss some of the treatments later on. Uh, we further stratify the risk of this organ confined prostate cancer based on the PSA uh, value, the Gleason score, which we just discussed and the clinical state. And if you have a low PSA, a low Gleason score, and a low stage, that's a low risk prostate cancer. And if uh, you look at a higher score, higher grade, and higher stage, that's a high risk prostate cancer. So, as I mentioned, this cartoon just summarizes the staging of prostate cancer. So, in stage one, the cancer is restricted to the prostate, it hasn't spread outside the prostate. The green areas or the green P shaped structures represent lymph nodes. Stage two, it, has in, it is now involving more than one lobe of the prostate cancer. In stage three, it's actually gone outside the prostate cancer, uh, sorry, outside the prostate gland. And in stage four, not only it has gone outside the prostate gland, it has spread to the lymph nodes and other organs such as the bones and rarely and the liver or the lungs. 
So if you are diagnosed or unfortunate enough to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, there are multiple questions that go through your mind. And we are asked these questions uh, very often. Will I have to stop working? This is very relevant. Uh, if it is organ confined and you get surgery or some other type of treatment, is there a risk this cancer will come back? If you undergo prostate cancer surgery, will that lead to impotence? Um, will I have to wear diapers for the rest of my life? Will this treatment bankrupt me? So all these are very relevant, appropriate, important questions that come through your mind. And hopefully through these type of talks, we can answer uh, most of these questions. So RRP stands for retropubic radical prostatectomy. This is a, a surgical, the original surgical approach in treating organ confined prostate cancer. Uh, usually used to take about three to four hours and is done under general anesthesia. I won't go into the technical details of the operation, but surgeons such as Dr. Lee would cut out the prostate gland with the prostate cancer. And then the remaining urethra is sewn back directly to the cap. Uh, to the bladder, sorry. After this uh, original approach, uh, which required a bigger incision, the treatment changed to a laparoscopic approach requiring smaller incisions using telescopic instruments called, uh, called laparoscopes as shown in this cartoon. All of these have cameras which allow the surgeon to view inside the abdomen, look at the cancer directly. And this type of approach is associated with more rapid recovery. But it's unclear still if there's any benefit from uh, or in terms of cancer control, urinary or sexual function using a laparoscopic approach. But more recently, probably for the past decade or so, the robotic surgical approach has become most popular, especially in Singapore, whereas the surgeon is actually operating from a console uh, outside the actual operating theater which has a 3D screen and a robot has arms uh, which are manipulated by the surgeon. And these are high precision uh, instruments. Uh, and these, with the help of the console, the surgeon can move these arms in a very precise way. Uh, the cost is obviously higher than a traditional prostate cancer surgery. And some would argue the benefit is unclear. There's no question that recovery time is faster. And most of my colleagues, such as Dr. Lee, who do this type of surgery on a daily, on a, on a regular basis, I should say, uh, definitely feel that it's, it's a more uh, accurate approach uh, in, in treatment of surgical treatment of prostate cancer. Switching to radiation therapy, not every patient's prostate cancer is uh, removable by surgery. And there can be many. Uh, factors that prevent uh, a good surgical outcome. One could just be high risk of surgery due to the age of the patient. Uh, some could be anatomical factors such as the local stage of the prostate cancer. Radiation therapy essentially is high powered x-rays that damage DNA of the cancer cells, thereby killing them. Um, this can be external beam, meaning the radiation comes from external source and it's aimed at the prostate, or it can be brachytherapy where actually radioactive seed implants are inserted or implanted into the prostate, they release the radiation, and then they become inert. So for external beam radiation, the goal is to maximize damage to the prostate and minimize damage to the surrounding tissue because the bladder and the rectum is not affected by the cancer, so we don't want to damage them. And this technique has uh, improved tremendously over the past uh, 20 years with more precise delivery of radiation using newer techniques. And now we have proton beam radiation, which soon we will have in, radi uh, in Singapore, which is probably the most precise way of delivering radiation to the prostate gland. In brachytherapy, as this cartoon shows, this is an X-ray of a patient where radi multiple radioactive implants are inserted or injected into the prostate gland. And they just, uh, they have a limited lifespan, they release radiation, kill the cancer, and they just stay there without um, affecting the patient subsequently. I also want to emphasize that not every cancer needs to be treated. So there are situations where 
even though there is a diagnosis of prostate cancer, after discussion with the patient, looking at all the pros and cons, we may decide not to treat and just monitor the cancer carefully because it may not affect the patient's remaining life in a significant way. As I had mentioned before, studies have shown that prostate cancer is very common in old men and you may die with the prostate cancer rather than die from the prostate cancer. So in situations where the cancer is very early stage, low grade, PSA is low, this can be monitored very carefully with regular PSAs and maybe perhaps annual biopsies. And the treatment approach can be changed if the PSA suddenly starts going up very quickly or the biopsy results show a more aggressive variant of prostate cancer. Just ending up, this is uh, what we don't want to see and what we want to avoid. Uh, as Dr. Tan mentioned in lung cancer, similarly in prostate cancer, unfortunately in Singapore, majority of the time we are diagnosing the cancer in advanced stage when it has already spread outside the prostate. This is an example of uh, a patient's autopsy in which the spine or the backbone is riddled with these prostate cancer cells and deposits. It can be quite debilitating uh, to the patient because it can cause a lot of back pain. And if you remember one of my slides mentioned uh, severe back pain as a symptom of uh, advanced prostate cancer. Again, fortunately, there has been a lot of development over the past 10 years. And this is the area that I am intimately involved in, which is the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. The, I don't have time to go over all the treatments in detail, but I would like to just mention a few. The mainstay of uh, treatment of advanced prostate cancer continues to be hormonal deprivation, which is mainly testosterone. This can be done either with surgical castration, hormonal injections, or oral tablets. This treatment has been around since the 70s, and uh, hormonal drugs have become more precise with less side effects. And in fact, this association of removal of testosterone in a man resulting in death of the prostate cancer goes back to the 40s where uh, an American scientist actually showed this association and got the Nobel Prize for it. Chemotherapy has been around now for almost 20 years for treatment of prostate cancer. We have two to three uh, new agents now, very effective, uh, but has some side effects. So the decision is made very carefully looking at the patient and the tolerability to chemotherapy. Radiation therapy, as mentioned before, is also used in advanced uh, uh, prostate cancer, sometimes to treat the bone which may be affected by the cancer to reduce pain, or more recently giving essentially liquid radiation in the form of injections. And this can be radium-223 or lutetium PSMA-177, which through the blood goes to all parts of the body where the prostate cancer has spread and results in treatment of the cancer and prolongation of a person's life. Targeted therapy is an exciting uh, new frontier in the treatment of prostate cancer. And this is also following in the footsteps of lung cancer where we have now detected mutations in prostate cancer that may be targeted by certain drugs, which are oral tablets. One example is BRCA mutant prostate cancer and a most recent uh, symposium or a conference that was just held about three weeks ago in the US on prostate cancer. A couple of trials were presented showing the benefit of these targeted agents in BRCA mutant prostate cancer. And lastly, a subset of patients like in lung cancer may benefit from immunotherapy in advanced prostate cancer. And usually these cancers are either MSI positive or have high mutation burden. So not to dwell too deeply into each treatment, but suffice to say that even advanced prostate cancer is not a death sentence anymore. And a lot of my patients live a good quality of life many, many years with either sequential use of these approaches or sometimes combinations. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chopra, for the excellent talk. Um, he has definitely made a very difficult 
topic or subject uh, 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 a lot more understandable, easy to digest for, for me and I'm sure for, for the audience as well. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in. Keep them coming in. Uh, once we finish our third talk, we'll move uh, straight on to the Q&A and all these questions will be answered then. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, um, the next talk will be by uh, Dr. Thomas So. Doc Dr. Thomas So is a senior consultant, medical oncologist at Onco Care Cancer Center. Something unique about Dr. So is that in addition to being a medical oncologist, he's also an accredited medical practitioner by the Office of Public Guardian to assist patients uh, who wants to make an LPA or lasting power attorney. All right. So prior to joining Onco Care, he is a medical oncologist in uh, NUH and a visiting consultant in Ting Fong General Hospital. All right. He's written many, many papers and is a principal investigator in a lot of studies on gastrointestinal cancer. And obviously, his subspecialty interests will include gastrointestinal tract conditions, uh, all the way ranging from the esophagus down to the stomach, to the colon, as well as rectum. His other interests also include hepatobiliary cancer. Uh, these are cancers that involve the liver, pancreas, and the gallbladder. All right, so um, there's no better person to take us through uh, the next talk then uh, on fight and prevent colorectal cancer. Uh, Dr. So, please. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for the kind introduction. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. It's not easy to be the last speaker, and I hope you enjoyed my uh, colleague's uh, talk so far. Uh, do send in your questions and we'll try our best to answer accordingly uh, towards the end, yeah? So today I'm talking about colorectal cancer. So let's uh, learn a little bit more about it, uh, learn about prevention, screening, and also how to combat and fight uh, this cancer. So perhaps I'll start off with some uh, disclaimers. I, I don't have any conflicts of interest and feel free to take screenshots of uh, these slides. Uh, all of the slides and information are actually available on the internet. Um, if you have a very, very specific personal topic or question um, with your own doctors, uh, please do discuss with your doctors as well also. Um, this doesn't constitute a consultation, yeah, um, but we'll be happy to help uh, when we can. Um, if you're unwell, please, uh, do, please see a doctor. Um, if you're unsure, please also see a doctor and Later in this talk, you'll realize that even if you're well, you should see a doctor for screening. So these are the topics that I'll be covering today. Um, what is colon cancer? How common is colon cancer? Um, how do I know if I may have colon cancer and how do I screen? And I'll touch briefly on treatment and management if someone is unfortunately diagnosed with colon cancer. So what is colon cancer? Um, first and foremost, back to very, very basic, uh, what is the colon? So when we eat, uh, food goes down into this passage called the esophagus or the gullet. It goes down into the stomach and then digestion con continues and starts, goes to the small intestines where most of food and nutrients are actually absorbed. Now, the remaining then goes to the large intestines. And actually the colon is another word and term for large intestines. It is a continuous passage, but for purpose of uh, medical classifications, uh, we do divide the colon into various parts. So you can see on the right, there's the cecum, the ascending colon where the colon goes up, the transverse colon where food goes horizontally, and then the descending colon where the stools move down towards the sigmoid where it goes a little bit of a loop. And then when it approaches the rectum, it is then passed out into the uh, toilet. Yeah. So how common is colon cancer? Um, not to scare everybody, but the current incidence of cancer killing a person as a cause of uh, mortality has past one in four. And it is estimated that in the next decade, uh, one in three uh, people uh, will pass away due to cancer. 
So this slide was also shared by my previous colleagues. So as you can see, close to 30% of people currently pass away due to cancer. And it is likely to approach one in three very soon. So colon cancer is the number one cancer right, in males and number two in females. So it is actually very common. So if you look at the past uh, few decades uh, in terms of the cancer incidence, colon cancer became uh, the top cancer in males uh, in the past two decades. Yeah? And it's actually remained there uh, consistently. Just to give you a brief idea, if the numbers don't make much sense to you, every day an average of five to six patients in Singapore are diagnosed to have colorectal cancer. And of these patients, a quarter of them are unfortunately diagnosed in the stage four setting where the tumor has spread outside of the colon. For females, um, it is the number two cancer, and it's been the number two cancer consistently um, since the 1970s. Yeah? Colon cancer has remained relatively stable uh, over the past uh, few decades. Um, but more importantly, the cause of uh, death from colon cancer um, has been decreasing. And this is actually due to many, many reasons. Uh, we hope to identify more patients with early stage colon cancer and therefore prevent them from passing away from this dreaded disease. Now, how to know if I have colon cancer? I think first and foremost, when a doctor sees a patient, um, any doctor, whether or not it's a general practitioner or a family doctor or a specialist, uh, will attempt to identify signs and the patient will share symptoms. So what are signs and symptoms? So a sign is what you show or what the doctor can see. Just like in this picture, this man is bald. So he doesn't have to tell the doctor that he's bald. Yeah, the doctor hopefully will be able to identify that he doesn't have any hair. A symptom is what you feel. So the patient will share with the doctor what he or she may be experiencing. And if there are any particular red flags, uh, persistent symptoms, then the doctor may take it a step further and order the relevant investigations. Um, now, I would like to emphasize that it is also important that sometimes after a consultation, um, if the symptoms persist, it's also important to stick to the same doctor where possible because then um, the doctor may have a lower threshold to investigate uh, with the correct investigations rather than Dr. Hopp. So some of my colleagues have also highlighted what are the symptoms of lung cancer, what are the symptoms of prostate cancer. And I would like to add that actually uh, symptoms of cancer, not necessarily just pertaining to colon cancer, can be rather non-specific. And so I would like to actually share that as doctors, what we look out for are actually the P's. Yeah? Persistent, the symptom doesn't go away, all right, despite tre some treatment and it doesn't go away with time. Progressive, uh, if it actually gets worse. Yeah. Now, the third P may or may not apply. Some patients may or may not actually feel pain. Yeah? And many a times, cancer can be painless, uh, largely in the early stage setting. Um, for colon cancer in particular, what we look out for are actually uh, symptoms pertaining to the bowels. So if there is bleeding in the stools, if it's persistent, yeah? Um, if there is a change in bowel habits, for example, if someone has had regular uh, bowel habits uh, daily, goes to the toilet daily to pass motion, but then, you know, it doesn't happen for two, three days and he gets diarrhea. If there's something that's not quite right, please go see your family doctor at least to get it checked. 
So I think the key thing to share is that, unfortunately, um, many do not have symptoms. So what do we then do? And how can we then combat this, you know, in the absence of symptoms? So therefore, screening is very important. So what is screening? Screening refers to testing patients yeah, uh, to look for or identify hopefully early stage cancer in the absence of signs or symptoms. Yeah? Um, while I would say that screening is uh, a, a, a tool which is currently uh, not un uh, fully utilized by many people, we are hoping that more and more uh, people actually go for it. The government is very, very proactive. There are many schemes. So do check with your family doctor. Um, there's lots of subsidies as well also. Um, incidentally, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so if you can actually uh, Google or go to some of the websites that I'm going to suggest later, you might be able to obtain screening kits as well also. So what are the recommendations for screening for colorectal cancer in Singapore? So the Ministry of Health uh, issued a guideline in 2010. Uh, this has not been updated uh, in the past 12 years, um, but some of the recommendations are actually still uh, uh, correct at this point in time. So they've actually advised uh, people above the age of 50 to actually either test their stools for identification of blood uh, um, annually. So I circled this term annually, which means that you should do it every year. Um, and it is not just to be able to look for blood, you know, uh, with the naked eye, you know, when you pass motion, okay, there's no blood, I'm good. But actually what we are hoping to identify is uh, blood that's not readily seen. So there are test kits available and I'll share it in my subsequent slides. Uh, the other way of screening is actually to do a colonoscopy, which is to insert a long tube uh, up through the backside area, right? To look directly inside the large intestines. Um, so this should be done every five or 10 years. Um, and a CT colonography, which is a CT scan, uh, which is similar to a colonoscopy, uh, but instead of sticking a camera inside, uh, it is actually like doing a CT scan where you actually try to visualize from the outside. And I'll share with you the pros and cons of each approach. Now, these recommendations are for average risk people. Yeah, meaning to say if there is no strong family history of cancer, yeah, um, if there are no severe medical problems that lead to an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Now, what are the factors that may lead to an increased risk? Um, in the setting of colorectal cancer, the biggest risk factor right, is actually a family history of colon cancer. And therefore, for patients with a known genetic risk, for example, we see here high risk. Yeah, if there are uh, genetic syndromes that predispose someone to colorectal cancer, we actually recommend these patients to start screening, right? Even from teenage years for this condition called familial adenomatous polyposis to in their 20s, if there is this condition called hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. Um, inflammatory bowel disease where the colon is actually very inflamed, uh, we actually recommend them to start screening from about 8 to 10 years from when they were diagnosed. So fortunately, these genetic conditions, right, FAP, HNPCC and inflammatory bowel disease, they are not very common. It accounts for less than 10% of all colorectal cancer uh, in Singapore. Um, but what's actually common is actually to have a family member, all right, with colon cancer or a uh, first or second degree relative. Now, if there is a direct family member with a history of colon cancer, we would recommend that they commence and start colorectal cancer screening 
earlier. And we do not just suggest for them to check stools for blood or to go for CT scans, but rather we do actually suggest for them to go through colonoscopy because it is potentially preventive as well also. So in other countries, they are potentially trying to bring down the age of starting the scopes uh, earlier. So in America, it's been brought down to 45 and there's been talk about them bringing it down to 40 as well also. Yeah? Um, the uh, different ways, uh, different countries have different ways of screening for colon cancer. So this is the FIT kit that I was talking about um, before. Um, there are many places that actually uh, do distribute these uh, kits for free. You can check up on the Singapore Cancer Society. Uh, nowadays, you don't even uh, need to actually collect it. Uh, the, sometimes uh, they may have a certain means of delivering it directly to your house. Um, and so this identifies uh, stools, uh, blood in stools that you cannot see with the naked eye. So this is actually how it's done, yeah? Um, so in the toilet bowl, usually we would suggest for someone to pass motion and not to pass directly into the water, yeah? It's very difficult to otherwise collect the stools. So it suggests to actually do the business slightly a little bit more in front uh, with some clean toilet paper, yeah? Uh, not to allow the stools to come in contact with water or urine. So then the kit comes in a twistable uh, cap. You take it out, you poke, um, at least five or six times directly into the stools. Close it, all right, put it in a clean bag and just mail it out, yeah? So the results uh, will usually uh, be uh, given to you. Uh, it may take some time, usually about a, a few days to maybe sometimes a few weeks if the volume is very high. And if it is positive, then patients uh, will actually be recalled to actually see a doctor and perhaps uh, do a scope. So what is a scope? So I've been talking about colonoscopy. Yeah? I'm using the word scope for short. Um, basically, it's a procedure to allow yeah, direct visualization into the large intestines. So there's a very long, flexible camera. All right. And this camera can transmit images. Now, what's important as well is that doing this procedure allows for biopsies. It also allows for polyps. Yeah, polyps are not necessarily tumorous, but they are actually uh, potentially precancerous. Yeah, so during this procedure, polyps can be removed. So this is uh, how it actually looks like. Yeah, there is a preparation phase involved where uh, patients, as instructed by their doctors, uh, will be given laxatives to take to cleanse and clean. Yeah, uh, the large intestines of uh, stools. Um, so then on the day of the procedure, um, the procedure can be done with you awake or with you actually drowsy or even sedated. And the camera actually goes into the intestines. And if there's identification of a polyp, the doctor will usually remove the polyp and send it for further investigations. Now, is there any difference between doing the stool testing and uh, colonoscopy? Now, if you are squirmish and you are actually worried about doing an invasive procedure, there is a study to say that actually um, both give the same results. But that's because actually more people are likely to agree to actually doing the stool test than to agree going for a scope. Um, from a direct medical point of view, um, doing a colonoscopy is still more accurate and it actually has a preventive role as well because doctors will remove the polyps when the scope is done. And so removing the polyps prevents it from ever becoming a cancer. So what is a virtual colonoscopy or a CT colonoscopy? So instead of putting a camera directly in, a CT scan is actually done. Um, but this is not exactly uh, without any discomfort as well also. Um, that's because the main discomfort for doing a scope is actually the need for 
the colon to be cleansed. Yeah, you need to drink laxatives, you need to drink medicine to have diarrhea and clean it. So if you are going for a CT colonoscopy, you actually do need to do that as well also. Um, and, you know, some people said, I prefer this because I don't have to stick anything into my backside. But actually, when they do a CT colonoscopy, um, there still needs to be something stuck into the backside because we need to insert uh, a tube inside to inject air so that uh, we can actually see the colon uh, better. Um, and it doesn't remove the polyp. Yeah. So again, my preference uh, is actually for uh, you guys, if you are in the appropriate age group, um, to actually go do a colonoscopy. So a colonoscopy is not just about screening. Yeah? It's not just about identification uh, of colon cancer. I think a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to know. Yeah, I don't want to do a scope because I don't want to know um, that I may have cancer, but it actually does prevent. I saw a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, is there anything I can do to prevent prostate cancer? and all that, um, guess what? You can actually prevent colon cancer potentially by doing a scope. Yeah, so, so this is something that uh, uh, you all should actually do. Now, there are many patients that ask me, um, is there a role for doing tumor markers? The most common tumor marker for colon cancer that's done is uh, CEA, yeah? Now, the ministry does not advocate or does not advise uh, doing of uh, tumor markers to actually screen for colon cancer. Um, and that's because there are many reasons why a tumor marker can be high. Cancer is just one of the many reasons. Yeah. Um, so even uh, conditions such as inflammation of the bowel, yeah, obstruction, constipation, pregnancy, all right, smoking can also give rise to false elevation of tumor markers. Um, of course, I do have anecdotally many patients whom were detected having colon cancer through CEA. But I would say that given the choice between doing CEA and recommending a person to actually doing a scope for both prevention and identification, I would still strongly advise someone not to do CEA, but rather to make the effort to discuss with a doctor to actually go for scopes. Now, in the unfortunate setting that someone has colon cancer, how and what happens after? Now, colon cancers are usually diagnosed through a colonoscopy, all right? And even if someone has advanced colon cancer, meaning to say that the tumor has gone to the liver, bone, and many parts of the body, we would actually still advise that person to do a colonoscopy because we need to ensure that the tumor is not going to block right, the passageway, which is an emergency, so that the patient can undergo his subsequent treatments smoothly. Yeah? It's also important to get a biopsy all right, the tissue to actually confirm the cancer and because nowadays there are many different types of treatment, right, that can be used, yeah, um, um, for the treatment of colon cancer. So I will just go through the treatment in very broad general terms um, because everybody is different. Any, every person that's diagnosed with colon cancer uh, is treated uh, somewhat a little bit differently. For stage one to stage three, we usually intend to cure uh, these patients. So we hope to identify more patients in the early stage. And this is actually done with a combination of surgery uh, with or without chemotherapy. And chemotherapy can be given either before surgery or it can also be given after surgery. Radiation is usually reserved for use in uh, rectal cancer where the uh, margins, where the area is actually not so free. And so the radiation helps to lower the chance after surgery or before surgery that the tumor would relapse uh, within the fat area or within the operation area. Now, if the tumor has actually gone outside of the colon, um, is it end game? Yeah, is it terminal and all that? Actually, for colon cancer, it's one of the earliest cancers where we have actually identified that even if it has spread outside of the original organ, uh, it is not all doom and gloom and we do attempt to still cure some of these patients. 
And therefore, if a patient is stage four, if it has gone into the liver, for example, we still divide these patients up into three groups. Yeah? The first group is palliative, where actually we give chemotherapy to hopefully prolong the patient's life and improve the quality of life. The second group is curative, where through a combination of chemo and surgery, all right, possibly even radiation, all right, we still try to cure. And the third group is a group of patients where currently we can't cure yet because the tumor is not operable, but if they get a very good response, they are potentially curable. Yeah. So therefore, whenever someone is diagnosed with stage four, it doesn't equal to terminal. Yeah. Usually the oncologist will discuss and clarify the intent of treatment. I won't go through all the uh, individual drugs, um, but I would actually share with you that prior to the current century, there was only one, maybe two medications uh, um, in this list that uh, was used for the treatment of colon cancer. And this list is still enlarging and expanding uh, right now. And so we have more and more options for the treatment of colon cancer at hand. Even for early stage colon cancer, where we give chemotherapy after surgery, um, our knowledge of the cancer, um, the performance of patients, the improvements of surgical skills uh, have improved through the years. And so we used to give 18 months, one and a half years of chemotherapy after surgery. And through the years, you know, this has evolved to us giving only three months of treatment after a stage three surgery, not just low risk, but this has expanded into even normal or high risk stage three at this point in time. Survival of colon cancer that has spread outside of the organ and in a non-curative setting uh, is ever increasing. We are actually approaching the three-year mark currently. And this is not a definitive number, yeah? So usually when the doctors say on average, if this has spread outside the organ, um, on average people live for three years, it's not to say that you only have three years left to live, yeah? Uh, often at times, uh, patients, uh, more than half of the patients actually live beyond and they go on and on to have very fruitful, meaningful lives, yeah, that uh, go on for years. So for colon cancer, if you've been diagnosed and if you've undergone treatment, there is also a follow-up plan as to monitor for relapse, uh, to monitor for new colon cancers, because that's also another risk of developing colon cancer. Um, and so this is usually done in combination with a combination of blood tests, scans, uh, and scopes. So in summary, colon cancer is very common. It's uh, the most common cancer in males and the second most common in females. Um, it is actually curable in the early stage. Uh, and therefore, we hope to identify patients in the early stage or, as I was mentioning just now, even prevent this cancer from ever happening. So it's preventable, yeah? So please start screening uh, when you can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So, for the nice talk. I'm sure everyone will agree that, you know, they'll learn very much in regards to uh, prevention and detection of colorectal cancer or colon cancer. Okay. Uh, we'll come to the end of the segment of the presentation. Um, uh, I'm sure we we'll learned a lot from our panel of specialists from Onco Care Cancer Center. All right. Um, it leaves me to thank uh, our kind organizer, uh, Singapore Society of Oncology for organizing this session, a panel of specialists from Oncocare Cancer Center uh, to participate and share their knowledge with all of us and our kind sponsors as well, without which, okay, this, this talk will not be possible. Uh, these are pharmaceutical companies, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Merck, and Sanofi. Okay, we come to the exciting part of the segment, okay, which is the Q&A uh, session, which everybody uh, is waiting for to have the answers uh, answered, uh, questions answered. Okay, we start with Dr. Tan first. Okay, the first questions we have here 
is from a Dave Cho. Question is, why is lung cancer common in ladies in their late 30s and early 40s, uh, especially when they're non-smokers as well? Uh, Dave has a few friends whose wives uh, were diagnosed with late-stage lung cancer at that age group. Thank you for the question, Dave. So um, for the longest time, the only risk factor that we're aware of was uh, smoking. But among uh, lung cancers that we see, especially in Asia, uh, we do see a sub particular subset. They are made out of female, Asian, East Asian ethnicity, mainly Chinese, uh, Korean, Japanese. Uh, for some reason, they have a high proportion. That has always been puzzling us for a while. Um, it's only in the turn of the century where we realize that actually there is a genetic predisposition, but this is not inherited from her parents. Uh, it just came about on its own. Uh, the EGFR mutation, that would be the main culprit. And it accounts for up to 50% of a female non-smoker of a Chinese or uh, East Asian ethnicity. So that would be the probably answer for that. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question from an anonymous attendee is that um, asking whether it's common if a patient or person using Tagriso for eight weeks uh, to achieve reduction in tumor size from 4.4 centimeters to 1.8 centimeters. Um, is that a good prognosis? Is that a good sign? Hmm. So this is a very specific question about a specific medication, but uh, it's, a, it's a quite a commonly used drug. It's a good drug. Basically, this particular medication, Targriso, is suitable for patients with the EGFR mutation. And if you do have that mutation, um, the response can be very rapid. As one of the illustrations that I uh, gave the other, uh, during my talk, a patient had a 10 days uh, prior starting of the treatment and his symptoms significantly improved. So from 4.4 cm to 1.8 cm, I would say that's about 50% reduction. And this is expected uh, in a patient who has started on the RISO. Okay, All right. Um, regards to the treatment with Tagriso, another question. Okay, once a patient has started on Tagriso and tumor size has shrunk to almost uh, totally not visible and the CA8 marker has reduced to less than 5.5, um, can this patient stop the treatment? First, I want to congratulate this particular patient or the relative or the friend. I, I think he has done or she has done very well on this medication. And uh, anecdotally, I have patients who have achieved similar responses as well. I think the key here is that uh, this is suitable for patients who has initially had an advanced disease where you become uh, undetectable. Uh, this is where we are trying to convert from a very incurable disease, perhaps into a more chronic disease situation. And uh, the general guideline at the present moment is to continue as long as the patient is able to continue uh, uh, the medication, because I think there's always a fear that the moment we stop the medication, the situation may get worse and the cancer may relapse, uh, at least for the time being. Mm, yes. Um... We have advanced uh, quite a fair bit in terms of treatment regime. Okay, um, we move on to the prostate part. Okay, um, I have a question for Dr. Chopra now. Uh, Dave has asked, okay, why does prostate grow in size as one ages? Are there ways to slow down the growth? And if there are, uh, are there any benefits from doing so? Okay, that's a great question. And I got to answer, I got to admit, I actually don't know the answer. Why does the prostate uh, grow in size? as you age. Dr. Lee, would you have the answer to that question? Well, from your Roger's point of view, I think um, that there are factors that we can't control age. And I think the prostate grow mainly because of exposure uh, uh, to, to circulating male testosterone. And in combination with some genetic factors, family history, um, um, that's one of the reasons why prostate grow in size. Um, in terms of ways to slow it down, uh, naturally, I don't think there's any, but there are medication uh, that's available uh, that we can use uh, to control the growth of prostate um, in terms of blocking some of this uh, uh, testosterone pathway uh, to stop uh, the activation of these uh, growth factors within the prostate. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Sorry, my focus was on <laughs> cancer, not on benign enlargement. All right. He and saved me there. <laughs> a, a question from Alfred. Uh, frequent urination during the night, is it related to prostate cancer? 
Yeah, again, a question probably best answered by Dr. Lee, but I would say mm-hmm. that not necessarily. Uh, more often than not, frequent urination uh, is a symptom of enlarged prostate and not prostate cancer. Uh, or other right. factors, uh, endocrine, hormonal factors, uh, even sleep apnea sometimes can present like that. Mm, okay. So it's good to get checked by your doctor if you have that symptom. Right. Uh, question from Hayati. When should a PSA level be drawn? Yeah, so that's a, also an excellent question. I assume they're saying uh, screening, what is the right age to start screening? So it is dependent, uh, uh, I guess, based on which country you live in. But on an average, uh, most uh, experts believe that PSA screening can be started around the age of 50, as long as a person's estimated lifespan is going to be more than 10 years from that day. Um, There are some uh, exceptions, of course. So someone with a strong family history or a known BRCA2 mutation, there we would start screening uh, generally uh, at an earlier age, maybe at 40. But... Uh, for average risk person, 50 to 55 is the uh, appropriate age. Yeah. Um, a question from Sue King. Okay. Can PSA reading be affected by a usage of finasteride uh, if it's prescribed as a treatment for enlarged prostate? Yeah, again, uh, excellent question. Very knowledgeable audience we have today. So in fact, yes, finasteride uh, in multiple studies has shown uh, to reduce the PSA level by 50%, up to 50%. So most urologists uh, would factor uh, uh, in that uh, use of finasteride and uh, calculate the prostate based on that usually by a factor of two. Um, Dr. Lee, please add on if if there's something else. (laughs) I agree with you completely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Use of the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which are... This class of drugs that we use uh, to treat prostate enlargement uh, do, in general, um, uh, half uh, the actual PSA level. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, another question from uh, Anam. What are the prominent symptoms of prostate cancer? Yes, thank you for the question. So we, we uh, I did discuss that a, a bit uh, during the start of my presentation. Um, so... Prostate cancer, unfortunately, most of the time may not have specific symptoms because it tends to start growing at the outside of the prostate. Uh, so by the time you have symptoms related to urination, such as uh, difficulty passing urine or even blood in the urine or painful urination, it may already be quite advanced at that time. Um, back pain because of spread of the cancer to the bone. Uh, these are usually uh, symptoms at uh, later stages. Early stage, very non-specific, and that's why I think uh, doing a PSA test and, and seeing a specialist urologist like Dr. Lee for examination is probably the prudent thing to do. Okay. Um, okay. The, um, okay. So from an anonymous attendee, is it true that before biopsy is done to the prostate, it is better to do an MRI to determine whether a biopsy is needed? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, it is true that uh, newer technologies and techniques such as, uh, I think it's, it's called MRI fusion biopsy, uh, are very useful, especially for small prostate cancers. Uh, and that's where the, the main utilization would be because they're more targeted and more specific uh, to the area of uh, abnormality on the prostate as seen on MRI scan. But for a, a cancer that uh, or a prostate gland that is palpable, uh, abnormal, hard, uh, routine biopsies uh, without the use of MRI, that should be sufficient. Definitely. Um, to a certain extent, uh- what, at least from urologist's point of view, um, having an MRI done uh, will help us target um, lesions a lot better. And the use of MRI in situations whereby um, there's elevated PSA can actually uh, reduce the need for actual biopsy in a certain subgroup of patients if the MRI shows no um, um, visible lesions. For instance, if the MRI do detect that, you know, the areas of inflammation that can explain for the elevated PSA that that patient actually uh, will save himself the um, the painful experience of biopsy yeah all right thank you 
Okay. Uh, uh, Nsiu Moy is asking if if a patient do go for a, a procedure to remove the prostate, what are the pros and cons and what are the side effects? Yeah, that's a great question, but a question that can take an hour to answer. <laughs> Uh, I think it depends on multiple factors, uh, the type of surgery, the competency of the surgeon, uh, the physiology of the patient, the anatomy. Uh, so without, you know, trying to sound too vague, um, the things to look out for after uh, prostate cancer surgery is uh, impotence and loss of urine control. Those are the two main things. Uh, and they are, again, dependent on a variety of factors. Um, other than that, your yeah, pain, blood loss, all those are nowadays very well uh, managed for. I think those are the things to look out for. Okay. Um, there's a Kaja who asks, can prostate cancer become metastatic? Yes, 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 and I, as I mentioned in my talk, unfortunately, half of the time, and at least in my experience in Singapore, by the time we detect prostate cancer, it's already metastatic. It has a high propensity to spread to the bones uh, due to the, the unique anatomy of the prostate and the, and the blood uh, supply of the prostate. So what we are trying to do with these kind of educational talks is to uh, raise awareness so that we can detect these cancers at the earlier stage when they are curable. Although uh, even metastatic cancer is highly treatable, but as of today, it's still not curable. So I'd rather we've, God forbid, if you have cancer, you'd rather find it at an early stage where there's a potential for cure. Hmm. Okay. Um, a question from Simon, again to Dr. Chopra. If someone has both prostate and lung cancer, how, do you, how does one know whether it is prostate or lung cancer that has spread to the bones and limb nodes? Yeah, so that, you know, gentleman is obviously quite unfortunate and unlucky. It's uh, rare to have one cancer in a lifetime, let alone two cancers. But uh, me, as I mean, I'm sure the rest of my colleagues have seen this kind of situation before. Um, so again, depends on multiple factors. So PSA level could be a good start, a very high PSA level. Prostate cancer spread is, is quite unique. As I said, uh, uh, most average prostate cancers, but majority of the spread is actually um, in the bones. Uh, it can spread to the lymph nodes, but usually the pelvic lymph nodes, but rarely it can spread all the way up to the neck lymph nodes. Um, so, you know, if you are not certain, you know, biopsy is the only way. Sometimes you have to biopsy two separate lymph node areas. Uh, but again, uh, you know, the pattern of spread can sometimes help us figure out if it's more lung or, or prostate. But if you just can't tell, then you know you have to biopsy uh, one or maybe two areas to see if the spread is from the prostate or the lung. Uh, and just to add to that, you know, prostate cancer, if it spreads to multiple parts of the body, you will see a big cancer going out of the prostate into the lymph nodes around the prostate. Um, whereas if, if it uh, it was a lung cancer, you may not necessarily see that uh, those features in the prostate. Yeah. So tough question to answer, but uh, if, if you can't figure it out, you have to biopsy. All right. Uh, move on to Dr. So, right? Get him involved in the Q&A. Uh, anonymous question that came in, how often do one need to do colonoscopy? So if you remember the uh, slide that I showed just now, um, most of the time in Singapore, we advise a person to start the first colonoscopy if it's an average rich individual uh, at the age of 50. Now then that scope will determine when the next scope will be. So for example, if the doctor identifies that this patient has many polyps and if some of the polyps have precancerous features, um, then he may need a repeat scope uh, in a year's time. Um, if it is uh, already starting to turn what we call very, very dysplastic, uh, almost like an early stage cancer, uh, sometimes an earlier scope in just about three to six months time may be required to make sure that when the polyp was removed, it was also removed cleanly. Um, but in the absence of polyps, yeah, if it was a very clean scope, 
uh, most of the time we would advise the second scope to be done uh, five or 10 years later. Yeah, so it actually depends on the risk of the individual as well, so which shows why the slide just now was a very busy slide. Um, it had different risk categories. Uh, it had different uh, uh, types of screening for different people as well. From anonymous attendee, if polyps is detected during colonoscopy in Singapore, is that a standard SOP that these polyps are removed and sent for biopsy? Okay. Um, it is usually the case um, because while there may be different types of polyps uh, and some different types of polyps may have a higher incidence of uh, being precancerous or turning cancerous, you can't tell just by the appearance uh, with the naked eye. So in general, these are actually sent for examination under a microscope where the cells are actually identified and if they are actually uh, features of a turning cancerous scene, then the doctor will then advise the patient what's the next step or what's the next interval. Uh, I won't say there's an SOP per se to send the polyps to a particular place, but the pathologists who are well-trained specialists to read microscopes, they do have uh, training in this particular area to identify these, uh, these cell types and cell changes. Mm, okay. From another attendee okay uh, who asked if uh, there's this uh, fecal immunochemical test which can be done annually uh, if this is negative or clear does it mean that the person does not have colon cancer yeah so if you notice that uh, we would recommend fit to be done annually simply because in terms of the detection rate yeah, the detection rate of FIT being positive in someone with colon cancer, also known as the sensitivity, um, is not very, very high. Um, tests show that it can range from anywhere between 40% to 60%, but that's not ideal. And therefore, to overcome this uh, low sensitivity, um, doing it regularly, doing it yearly, for example, increases the detection rate. And therefore, uh, in the study that I was mentioning, if someone was to do it uh, regularly, the pickup rate can be as high as that of a colonoscopy, simply because it's easier to do and more people are willing to do. Now, if there's any suspicion, meaning to say, if I am worried that I have colon cancer, now, I wouldn't just depend on a FIT test being negative to clear myself. If I really want a more definitive answer um, and also to prevent, um, I would actually uh, go for a scope. Okay. I think this relates to um, uh, a story that's shared by Dave, okay, in regards to his late dad, who has FIT screening Dunda was negative despite having blood in stools. Um, later on, a few months down the road, he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. So, so mm. his question again would be if the FIT is not 100%, despite blood in, in a stool, uh, he wants to, he want to understand, understand why and what can be done. Yes. So, so, so therefore, very similar to the previous question, um, FIT is not 100%. Um, the only reason why FIT is still in the guidelines is simply because on a mass population screening perspective, more people are willing to do it. It is non-invasive. Uh, but as you can see, it's only confined to what we call normal risk people. Um, for patients with symptoms, for example, for patients whom the GP or the specialist highly suspects all right, that there could be a possible colon cancer and FIT alone is, is, is really inadequate. Yeah, so I'm sorry to hear about uh, Dave's uh, late dad's example. And therefore, really, the objective of this talk is also really to encourage people um, to go for scopes. Um, FIT is good, yes, but there are better ways to detect, to prevent colon cancer. Uh, Dave has another question for you. Does eating more fiber-rich food prevent colon cancer? So there are many, many studies to show uh, that food plays a part in development of colon cancer. Um, I would say that actually having a sensible diet uh, is most important. Um, 
Additional uh, addition of fiber in the diet, yes, it lowers the risk of colon cancer. Taking less processed food can lower the risk of colon cancer. But I would say that you know being sensible in the diet is obviously most important. A balanced diet is the most important. Exercise, live cleanly, live cleanly, don't smoke, and go for the scope. Yeah, um, I I have many patients whom are vegetarians all their lives. And when they are diagnosed with colon cancer, there is usually a sense of disbelief, you know. Um, so nothing is actually 100% in prevention uh, uh, in terms of diet and all. And even scopes, yeah, while we say that, uh, they, that they're preventive, you need to actually go for regular colonoscopies in order to achieve that desired effect as well also. So I would say prevention and combating colorectal cancer is a combination of all these means and measures. Okay, right. Um, Simon asks uh, if a colon cancer patient has been in remission for 11 years, um, will, be, will you come back again? Uh, that's his question. Okay, Simon, I'm assuming uh, you're probably talking about yourself and congratulations to you for being cancer-free for 11 years. So usually, uh, most cancers, colon cancer included, if there is relapse, it tends to occur usually within the first three to five years. So many cancers, uh, many people, cancers, they use this five-year golden rule mark. It's actually uh, based on some principles of the probability of relapse. Now, the longer one is cancer-free, the lower the chance of relapse. Uh, of course, never say never. I mean, I have seen relapses after many, many years as well also, but they really are the minority. Uh, but more importantly, the risk, right, uh, not necessarily of relapse, but of developing another colon cancer still exists if there is still some colon left uh, in that person. So therefore, for these patients, we still encourage uh, regular surveillance, uh, regular colonoscopies, all right. Uh, not necessarily just to watch out for relapse, but also to be mindful potentially of developing another cancer. Okay. From an anonymous attendee, um, he or she wants to know what's the longest survival time of a stage four colon cancer patient that has a metastasis to the liver? Okay. So this patient has stage four because the tumor has gone to the liver. Um, for stage four colon cancers, uh, we divide these patients into curable, potentially curable and not curable. And so the longest time I've seen is basically the patients being cured of the colon cancer. Yeah, I've been in practice for about 20 years. So 20 years, that's the longest I've seen. Thank you very much. Okay, so Robert asks if his bowel habits has always been two to three days interval and the stool is hard and followed by loose stool. Is that an indicator of colon cancer? Well, if it's persistently like that, you know, I would say that that may be an indicator. So please do see your family doctor and uh, get a referral. And then, uh, of course, go for scope. The scope is fine. That's great. If there's polyps, it can be removed. If there's tumor, hopefully we identify it at the early stage. So please don't wait. Yeah. Good. That's a good answer. Um, for the panel, okay, so this goes out to anyone who, who can answer this. So there's a question that comes in. Uh, they ask, do, does any of the panel oncologists uh, recommend first performing a genomic testing uh, versus performing biopsy? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead. Uh, I, I think this may be in a very rare or specific situation where someone has suspicious findings on a scan and a biopsy is either high risk or a patient is not keen for a biopsy and uh, it's suggestive of, for example, uh, lung cancer and, and the uh, physician may consider doing a genomic test in the blood uh, to find uh, a unique mutation that may be very specific to lung cancer such as EGFR. But that is my assumption. Um, I am not a believer of uh, substituting a genomic test for diagnosing cancer. Diagnosis of cancer still is based on a tissue biopsy, and that's my opinion. Do the rest of the panel agree with that? Hmm. So uh, Dr. Tan Chi Singh here, I, I would fully agree with Dr. Akil. So nothing replaces the gold standard of diagnosing cancer using a tissue. 
Um, so because with that tissue, we can do a spe more specific testing uh, to guide the treatment. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of caveats when we do just bypassing the standard of care and go straight to the genomic testing. And uh, we do not want to be uh, caught up with this kind of uh, um, murky uh, situation. Okay. So at least in the context of colon cancer, um, I did mention that it's important to actually do the scope. Uh, that's because in colon cancers, uh, the tumors may obstruct, uh, which is a medical emergency. So therefore, uh, since we are already assessing directly into the tumor, um, I, I, I would prefer tissue biopsy. Um, genomic biopsies, I guess, are attractive because uh, they are non-invasive, you just take blood and all. Uh, it is something that is very useful, um, but in general, at least for the initial diagnosis, you can see that all three of us uh, actually concur that we would prefer um, directly biopsying uh, the tumor itself. Um, another general question um, for the panel uh, from Dave, does exercise and living a healthy lifestyle, like eating healthy and managing stress, help reduce the risk of cancer? I, I think I'll answer that, yeah. Yes. When, ahead, when it also. comes to yeah. exercise, um, there are actually uh, several large studies to show that actually exercise reduces the overall risk of cancer. Um, and very specifically, actually, it's 150 minutes of exercise uh, per week. Yeah. So uh, moderate exercise, not just pure walking and all. Um, uh, but I would say it's important overall to live a clean lifestyle. Uh, we know that uh, the biggest risk factor for many cancers uh, is smoking. Yeah. So if you uh, smoke, please quit. If you don't smoke, don't start. All right. Sensible diet. Um, um, you should feel good exercising. So you mentioned that, you know, it has to be, you know, does it reduce stress, right? If exercise gives you stress, then it defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. So enjoy life. Um, take a moment to smell the roses. All right. Lead a stress-free life. And uh, whatever comes, you know, just deal with it. That's what I usually advise my patients. Any additional advice from the rest of the panel? No? Okay. Um, I think this is, the next question is directed at Dr. Tan. Uh, Nosahida is asking, if someone is a secondhand smoker, how long um, does it take before they have a possibility of developing lung cancer? Mm. So the intent, so even though a person does not uh, have a direct smoking, but uh, by inhaling a secondhand smoking uh, has been shown over in the lifetime, for example, a spouse increases your risk by about 20 to 25%. If your parents uh, smoke when you're younger, and uh, increases the risk about 10 to 15 percent. This is a ballpark figure. Uh, I think there's no specific uh, guideline uh, to say that you must uh, limit second smoking because I, I think it's also a little bit um, your family situation, um, your neighbor situation. You, you can't escape, the, you can't just uh, live at another place, for example. So I think the longer you are exposed to smoking, the higher the chance of you getting a lung cancer. Again, from Nosahida is asking again for Dr. To, to question directly to Dr. Tan again. Uh, she has a friend who is an active smoker and he always complained of lethargy and malaise and, um, and also has suicidal symptoms as what you mentioned in your talk earlier. Uh, he asked if it's possible that this friend of hers has lung cancer and uh, she has advised him to actually see a doctor but he's scared of uh, the possibility of being diagnosed with cancer. Um, he's, she's asking advice on what she can do for him. Hmm. So I think it's a very difficult question. Um, it's very kind of you to be very helpful, to be very um, attentive to this patient, uh, family members or friend. It sounds like there is a slight higher chance of getting a lung cancer because of the higher risk uh, associated with chronic smoking. And I would highly advise the patient uh, or the friend to go to the uh, doctor for screening for also for a checking up uh, because once we can confirm that there is a tumor, it's better to diagnose it in the earlier stage where the treatment can potentially still cure 
the patient, not forgetting that uh, it is uncommon to diagnose a lung cancer in the earlier stage because mainly because uh, in the earlier stage they do not present with any symptoms. So fortunately at the present moment, there are multiple uh, treatment options available for lung cancer patient uh, even in the early uh, late stage and also early stage where they has been shown to improve survival and cure in the long run. Okay, All right. Um, enormous question. Uh, I, I think for Dr. Tan to answer, for diagnosis of lung cancer, is chest x-ray good enough? Mm. So for the longest time, the chest x-ray has been investigated. Uh, some studies have used a phlegm, the sputum, uh, to check for any cancer cell has been investigated. None of them has been shown to improve cancer specific mortality. Uh, the only study so far and the modality so far that has been shown to improve uh, survival will be that of a low dose computed tomography or a CT scan of the lung. And that is the only uh, tool, screening tool that I will advocate for high risk patient. Okay, question for Dr. Chopra. Um, Regards to prostate cancer, how can one prevent uh, himself from getting it? And if this he or he has a surgery for prostate cancer, um, what can one do to help in the recovery once he get home? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, regarding the first part, how can we prevent uh, prostate cancer? That's tough to do unless you can change your sex. I become a woman. Uh, just that was just a, a joke, obviously. Um, well, it, in in continuation of what my colleagues have said, uh, I think leading a healthy lifestyle, uh, exercise, which I'm a big proponent of, uh, and and regular health screening, including the use of PSA, although in some countries that is contentious. I think those are the ways to try and again not prevent cancer, but if if you are unlucky enough to get cancer, at least uh, detect it early. But there is some evidence to suggest that uh, good lifestyle and the eating habits and exercise can decrease the incidence of cancer. The second question was regarding uh, post-surgical uh, uh, care, I, I, I think. So uh, this one is really beyond my expertise. I'm not a surgeon. So I can maybe defer this to Dr. Lee. Uh I, I think the, uh, your surgeon will know your, your surgical procedure better. Uh, he's, he, he, your surgeon will probably be the right person to, uh, to answer the question in regards to, to your care. Uh, he, during the surgery, he or she will know what has taken place and uh, what is at risk and your health condition. Uh, so so that, that is best left to your, your, the surgeon to, to answer. Uh. Okay, so, so, so from an anonymous attendee, this probably any, I'll, I'll pose this to all three panel, panelists, all right? Uh, if um, the various cancers are diagnosed at an early stage, how long does it take to treat the illness, assuming a positive outcome scenario? So maybe you start with Dr. Tan, lung cancer. Um, sorry, the question is... If, if you're diagnosed with early stage lung cancer, um, how long does the treatment regime take, assuming that you can, you, you, you manage to achieve cure? Hmm. So, um, so for example, lung cancer, earlier the stage, then the higher likelihood surgery is the possibility. For example, surgery obviously is a one-off procedure where it can be done in a couple of hours and the recovery usually is, takes about a week or two. And uh, depending on the actual final stage, they may not need to have any further treatment. For example, stage 1A. Um, increasingly, in a patient who are stage 2, stage 3, the conventional treatment will be that addition of about 3 months of chemotherapy. Um, there are additional treatment that can be considered. For example, oral te targeted therapy and immunotherapy. That has been shown to reduce the relapse of the cancer even further. So, but this has to be done in the individual risk profile, for example. What about prostate cancer, Dr. Chopra? Yeah, so um, similar to, to lung cancer as well, um, it really depends on the stage of uh, early prostate cancer, which can anywhere between stage one to stage three. 
So stage one, small organ confined prostate cancers. At this time, the recommendation is just surgery alone, uh, no additional treatment. So that is a quite a quick recovery. But you need to have a regular follow ups with the urologist with PSAs. Um, yeah, that goes same whether it's treatment is surgery or radiotherapy. Now, for more bulkier and locally advanced prostate cancers, which are still potentially curable, usually there's a combination of um, uh, there's some element of hormonal therapy added to the radiation therapy. Uh, and that can be, again, depending on which regimen you use, anywhere from six months to two years. Um, so at most two years, uh, in combination with radiation and hormone therapy, should suffice even for locally advanced prostate cancer. Dr. So? So for early stage colon cancers, so we are talking about stage one, um, surgery alone uh, is actually sufficient. So the treatment time is really the time that is required for the surgery and the recovery from the surgery. Um, usually patients um, are discharged from the hospital usually within a week and they may take anywhere between two to three weeks to get back to their usual eating habits and a few months to get used to their bowel habits and things like that. Yeah, For the later stages like stage two and three, we are talking about, uh, in general, three months of chemotherapy to reduce the risk of recurrence after the surgery. Um, and in the stage four settings that we are aiming for cure, we usually hope to combine, on average, about six months, sometimes a bit longer, uh, with the surgery uh, to try to cure the patient. Okay. We have time for one, one last question. Uh, this looks interesting. Okay, for Dr. So, if a colon cancer stage four survival... No, wait, no. From Amelia, okay. So she, she wants to know how significant is the role of rigorafinib in metastatic colorectal cancer? Uh, at, at which line of therapy should it be? Okay, so that's a very, very specific question. And uh, different oncologists have different management. Uh, so in general, as you remember, I do have many, many drugs and chemotherapy and even non-chemotherapy drugs uh, at my disposal. Um, so each drug has a side effect profile uh, that's different from another and each person's disease is very different. So some doctors may use regorafenib early on in the treatment, uh, usually after chemotherapy. Regorafenib is an oral targeted agent. Some, some doctors may recycle the chemo. Yeah, so uh, some patients responded very well to what we call first-line chemo. They move on to second, and then sometimes they reuse the first treatment again. So, so I think this type of treatment decision needs to be very individualized. Um, if you have been on regorafenib or been discussed uh, about starting regorafenib, uh, do check with your doctor uh, about the reasons why and indications and whether or not you think regorafenib is suitable for you or why your doctor thinks it's suitable for you. Okay, I think uh, time is running up. Um, we still have some, a few outstanding questions. I'm sorry, we can't attend to all of them, all right? But I hope we've answered adequately and at least we covered most of the questions and I hope this has been a fruitful uh, webinar for all of you. That leaves me to thank our panel specialist uh, that has put in a hard work of uh, doing the presentation and uh, being put on the spot and answer all some of these very difficult questions, okay? Um, uh, this webinar would not be possible without the uh, support, our kind sponsors. I need to thank them over again. Uh, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Merck, and Sanofi, uh, and our excellent team of panelists from Onco Care uh, Medical Center, all right? Um, if you're interested, you find this, uh, webinar meaningful and fruitful I urge you all to sign up to for the upcoming public talk on women's health uh, that will take place on the 23rd of April uh, at 2 to 4 p.m at the same time okay uh, the registration co code you can see online just uh, put your camera on it scan on it and register right I'm um, you I'm sure you learned a lot from that session uh, just like what you benefited from this session as well Okay, uh, for further inquiries in regards to, you know, cancer specific issues, feel free to reach out to uh, the panel specialist. Um, you, you can get an email or a contact uh, from, 
from your chat. Okay. Um, from all of us, again, have a thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Okay. I'm signing off together with Dr. Tan, Dr. Thank Chopra, you. as well as Dr. So. Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye.